Okay, good morning. Thank y'all for being here today. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I want to welcome you to worship today. We're so glad you're here, whether you're in person or online. We're glad that you decided to join us. If you are here in person, we'd love for you to sign the um, friendship registers and send them on down the line so we can get everybody's name. Um, if you're not here and you're joining us online, we are so excited that you at least have clicked on that website and you're looking at us and, you know, seeing something that you enjoy, and we're glad you're doing that. Some upcoming things with next Sunday, which is September 15th, we have our church kickoff for the year. We used to call it Rally Day. I don't we still call it Rally Day? Church kickoff. Whatever. We're having that next week. Congregational Ministries, we are going to provide the meat, which is going to be ham. It's going to be really good. Smithfield. It's going to have that glaze and everything on it. We're going to, yeah, we're going all out. And we're also providing bread and drinks. And the only thing we ask of you all is to bring like a side dish or a dessert. That's all we ask of you. And then... Again, September 19th is our um, adult fellowship night for football. We're going to be celebrating football, even though I have to say I woke up this morning, still my heart was heavy with that loss that Appalachian took yesterday. That's all I'm going to say about that. It was, it was bad. It was bad. And, but I will say it saved a fight for Dan and I because he wanted to go to the game. And I said, gosh, those tickets are pretty expensive, like 200 and something dollar a, a head. I said, we're not doing that. And thank goodness, because I think I would have walked out first quarter. And we would have lost $400, and I would have blamed Tim. So we at least are talking this morning. Okay, we didn't waste that money. All right, thank you for being here. I'm going to call Jody up. Charles. And good morning, and on behalf of the nominating committee, uh, we just want to give you a, a reminder, if you haven't had a chance to, to submit your representative uh, for the session or the past the nominating committee, please do so. Uh, those who have already done, thank you so much. Uh, out in the narthex on the round table, there are some forms also in your announcement page there's all the instructions here for us if you want to use the qr code if you want to go to the website to do it if you just want to fill it out there turn it into the office or turn it into one of the members of the nominating committee it's fine but we'd appreciate if you would at least submit your name that who you think would be a good representative for the church thank you thank you good morning are you here thank you Jeez, Louise, good morning, choir. Good morning. No. no name tag, no name tag, no name tag. All right, I'm going I'm to announce a Sunday in the future where we're looking for 100% name tags. That's going to be our goal, okay? Just, if you don't have one, I'm giving you time. All right, anyway, it's so good to be with you today. Um, I want to offer a correction in the bulletin. <laughs> It says no time for fellowship. I was thinking about that. Isn't there always time for fellowship? What we mean is there's no food. But there's always time for fellowship. So I hope you'll stay and I hope you aren't here just for the food. I hope you're here to greet one another. So let's greet one another following the service. It reminds me of a sign that was outside the Black Mountain Presbyterian Church parking lot. I love this sign. They have a parking lot right next to downtown and people like to park there and go shopping and all that. But their sign said this, public welcome except during church activities. <laughs> I finally pointed that out to them. They didn't even see it, which it, maybe is a reminder to us is what don't we see? But I love say I love that sign. And it said, we don't want the public here at church events now. But anyway, so, so we don't, we do have time for fellowship, no food. We'll have to reword that somehow in the future. Also, um, I want to let you know that some of you have indicated some interest in that study group, and today I hope is the deadline. What I plan to do, this is around the devotional material, and a copy of the book that's my copy is out there, don't take it, in a sign-up sheet. We're going to just have an interest session just to find out when we might meet. We'll hopefully do a hybrid if that is helpful to some of you, but 
Um, the sign-up sheet is in the narthex if you're interested in learning more about that study. And remind you of the congregational surveys. There's a box to put your surveys in, extra co- hard copies of surveys out there. So I do want to let you know some of our pastoral concerns now. And um, I don't know if you've heard yet, but Ann Gaither passed away yesterday. She made it into hospice for maybe a day or two. Um, she had been in the hospital and she had had a couple of falls. And you know how much Ann loved this church and we loved her. So pray for the family. Um, we don't have plans of when the service will be yet. Susan and Thomas are actually in France. They left Friday for France. So it'll be a couple of weeks till that service is um, going to take place here in the sanctuary. We're still talking about that. With um, I'm talking to Lawson and Comer about that. Um, also, Francis Insko, we're glad to hear. Thanks to Lynette for telling me we, um, she's back at Abernathy after her surgery, successful surgery, and she's recovering at Abernathy. And John Taylor... Um, fell off of it to let you know how easy it is, a railroad tied level step and broke three ribs. Be careful, those of us who are in the older generation. Um, simple things can lead to falls, but now the good news is he went home. You can't do much about ribs. And as I was talking to Edith, he said, oh yeah, he's pulling figs from the fig tree. He's collected about a gallon of figs. So you, you know, apparently this is a man that will not stop. And so we want to continue to pray for them, as if, if we will. Today I invite you to now um, listen to the beautiful music and center ourselves. Oh, by the way, I forgot to welcome the online people. Welcome. So glad you're here. Did you know we've been tracking how many people at least click on our online services? It's five to 600 people a week. Doesn't mean everybody's watching the whole service, but let's just say you get 20% of that. And then each of those homes often have more than one person watching. So I want you to be aware that this online presence is a very important part of our reach into the community. So we want it to be as good as possible. We want I would say, thank you, Bruce. Bruce is quietly up there, always providing this for us. And I I think that's an unsung task. So thank you, Bruce. And able assistance always. (laughs) We're grateful for you for making it possible. So now, having said that, whether you're online or in person, let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship God. Please stand in body or spirit and let us join together in the call of worship. 
This is a place where saints have gathered over the decades, a special home, holy ground, where scripture, song, and fervent prayer work with discussion, food, and care, have shaped our lives and the faith we share. This is a place for God. This is the place where saints are grown and as faith is shared and love is shown, where all who doubt or who believe are asked to give and receive and share with Christ the air we breathe. This is a place for God. This is a time of fond surprise for hearts and minds and ears and eyes, where what's gone wrong can be forgiven and what's to come is glimpsed or given, as together we receive a glimpse of heaven. This is a place for God. Please bow your heads and join me in the prayer of praise and adoration. Almighty and loving God, you have given us eyes to see you, hearts to know you, and voices to sing your praise. We gather here asking you to prepare us to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. With thanksgiving, we seek to be a living sanctuary for you and for the world you love. Amen. Surprise, surprise, no one is perfect, <laughs> right? Scripture says the only perfect one is God alone. That's what Jesus said. So we come here with humility. We come here knowing we're not perfect, but we also come knowing that we worship a God who is quick and easy and glad to forgive us of our sins. So it's in humility and in faith that we ask you to confess our sins before God and one another. Lord, give us the eyes of Jesus to see our neighbors and the strangers we meet. Teach us what it means to love the stranger as we love ourselves. Forgive us for our selfishness, for our silence, for not caring enough for the strangers who come to our communities. Teach us to love and care for the stranger the way you do. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. And Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life, it's finished, it's gone. The new life is fresh and new. <clears throat> Friends, hear and believe the good news of the gospel, that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven.
bow your head as we have our prayer of illumination. Gracious God, we do not live by bread alone. Let the heavenly food of the scripture we are about to hear nourish us today in the ways of eternal life through Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. Today's Old Testament lesson comes, well, there's two books of the Bible we're going to read from. The first one is Leviticus chapter 19, verses 33 and 34. When an alien resides with you in your land, you shall not oppress the alien. The alien who resides with you shall be to you as the citizen among you. You shall love the alien as yourself, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Our next book comes from Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 12 through 19. So now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? Only to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep your commandments of the Lord your God and his decrees that I am commanding you today for your own well-being. Although heaven and the heaven of heavens belong to the Lord your God, the earth will all with all that is in it. Yet the Lord set his heart in love on your ancestors alone and chose you, their descendants, after them, out of all the peoples as if it is today. Circumcise then the foreskin of your heart, and do not be stubborn any longer. For the Lord your God is God of gods, the Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who is not partial and takes no bribe, who ex executes justice for the orphan and the widow, and who loves the strangers, providing them food and clothing. You shall also love the stranger, for you were strangers, in the land of Egypt. God's people say amen. Let God's people say amen. amen. Thank you. I knew you could do it. We're going to let loose a little bit around here. 
I want to thank the choir. I often want to say that, but then Laura has her time with the children by the time I get up here. It seems like a past event, but y'all are just beautiful. I really appreciate it every week, and Brandon, I so appreciate your leadership. It's fun to work with Brandon. Kathy, you were fun to work with, too, but Brandon's, you know, you can have two fun people to work with. So thank you for that gift. Well, I was all prepared for a time for young disciples, but I don't see it, with all due respect, I don't see a young disciple in the room right now, but that's okay. Yeah, I know where they are. They're at Camp Greer. I was with them Friday night and Saturday, and um, there's a lot of young disciples at Camp Greer, and it was fun to spend time for them with them this weekend. So and, um, I'm going to save my wonderful time for young disciples for another event. And um, so let's turn now to God's Word. First, let's open with prayer. God, we thank you for the gift of your Word, how it nourishes your people and has for for millennia, really, in many ways. And so we thank you for the gift of word that is always relevant to our time and pray that we would hear that you, what you want to say to us this very day. We ask this in the strong name of Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> so the third reading today this has a theme attached to it. Let's see if you can pick up on the theme. Uh, it goes from, comes from Romans chapter 12. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in affliction. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Pursue hospitality to strangers. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. So I wonder when was the last time you read the words on the back of the bulletin that says, Welcome Newcomers. Probably been a long time. It's kind of faded into the background is my hunch. And it says, There are no strangers in this sanctuary. Now, if you've not read it lately, I invite you to read that. And it has a whole list of how we try to make you not be a stranger. Now, I wonder if you know where that came from. I can tell you where. I brought it here years ago. Now, do you know where I got it? I stole it. Oh, I recycled it. I recycled it from an old bulletin in my home church that I happened to have laying around, and it was on the back of that, and I liked it. It probably came from the 1950s or the 1960s when the church was just growing everywhere, and churches expected people to visit the church. Those were the boom years for Christianity, and my home church wanted to make sure that strangers felt welcomed in their sanctuary, so I brought it over here. I'm thinking my pastor, Dr. Kissling, put that together years ago, and, and it worked. Riverside grew from a little brown church to about 2,000-member church under his pastorate of 35 years. So they made a point to make sure people were welcome. No strangers in the sanctuary. I hope that's true here. Recently, I heard a Holocaust survivor named Itzhak, who had come to America as a research scientist. A few years ago, he was diagnosed with cancer, and... He, the story is told by Dr. Rachel Rem, Riemann, who works with cancer patients. She met Itzhak at a retreat for people with cancer. Now, Itzhak had come to the retreat to see if he could engage and defeat this enemy of cancer with the power of his mind that he trusted. Sounds like a Presbyterian to me, doesn't it? Power of the mind. At the retreat, there was a lot of sharing. There was a lot of touching and hugging and all that, more than Itzhak was comfortable with. He is not a touchy-feely kind of person. I bet you know that type. I bet some of you are that type. He would say, what is all this huggy-huggy anyway? What is this love the strangers? But he let them love him anyway during the retreat. He was so concerned about this, he prayed to God. He took his concern to God. He said, God, is it okay to love strangers? And God says to him, Itzhak, what is this strangers? You make strangers. I don't make strangers. God does not make strangers, but we do, don't we? As one person pointed out, we are the ones who decide to make people close to us or to make them distance. We decide who to let into our world and who to keep out. Sometimes a stranger is someone you just haven't said hello to yet. I like that. Well, a few years ago, I experienced for the first time in decades 
maybe in my life, to tell you the truth, what it was like to be a stranger in the church. Preachers don't get that very often. When we come to be your pastor, they welcome us with meals, and everybody wants to get to know us. You wear your name tags. Most of you do. Those kind of things. We just don't have that experience. Well, I went on sabbatical, and when I went on sabbatical, I wanted to know what is it like to be a stranger in churches? What's that experience like? So I went around to lots of churches. I turned out it's not that easy. And I learned that again in retirement when I started attending Black Mountain and Mountain Tree Presbyterian. It's just not easy being a newcomer. During the sabbatical, I visited churches, churches from Jerusalem to Pasadena, California, in Raleigh and in Cary. I wanted to learn how churches welcomed people. They were Presbyterian, they were Anglican, Malachite Catholic, Methodist, Lutheran. Some were Large, some were small. I even worshipped in a Jewish synagogue in Jerusalem. The worship ranged from high liturgical, and get this, they had a 16-page bulletin. How would you like a 16-page bulletin every week? Your printing cost, Jim, would go up out of the roof with a 16-page bulletin. Highly scripted. And then there was a little Presbyterian church that worshipped around tables in their fellowship hall. It was so cute. You know, they didn't have a bulletin because... Um, they didn't have a bulletin. They were worshiping without a bulletin because the PowerPoint projector was out that day. Very informal. By the way, did you know you can have worship without a bulletin? It's possible. You can do it. Some of my most difficult experiences, should I say, was included trying to worship with one church, looking up the time on their website, only to discover when I got there they had canceled the service during the summertime. No one had bothered to change the website. So I show up there. They were having summer Sunday school. So I thought, sure, I'll go to summer Sunday school. Why not? I'm, I'd like to see what that's like. Not one person spoke to me. I was a stranger in their midst. Oh, they talked to each other a lot. Not a soul spoke to me. So you know what I did? I left. I decided to go down the street to another worship service. I went to another church where I literally froze to death. You could have hung meat in that sanctuary. Again, not a soul spoke to me except the official greeters. It was a chilly experience in more ways than one. I learned how hard it can be come, how it can be come to get a simple welcome from someone in the pews. Even in churches who set up hospitality, even though they say they welcome everybody in their bulletin, it's just not true all the time. It seems that people in the pews often leave the welcoming to the official visitors and greeters and the pastors. In many churches, I observed members talking with fellow members and people all around me. I'll never forget a friend's church I went to. I'm sitting there, and somebody's on my left, somebody's on my right, and literally somebody comes up to the pew, reaches over me to greet their friend without acknowledging I existed. How is that possible? This is a good friend's church. Maybe it's me. Y'all tell me. Am I smelling? I don't know. I had even signed the fellowship register. Not a word. Friendliness all around, but not for this stranger in their midst. On the other hand, let me tell you, there's good news. There were many congregations that worked hard to welcome me and Sharon when she was with me. By the way, can I say, I'm glad this is not Jose's experience. I don't think it is. A single man has a harder time getting a welcome than when they're with, um, in a partnership. People don't talk to single men very much. That's my experience. It's a very interesting dynamic I haven't unpacked yet. But anyway, there, there was these wonderfully welcoming congregations. I remember one Presbyterian church where about 10 people greeted us before we even sat down. And they asked about us. They wanted to know about our lives. Now, I would go back to that church in a minute. If I lived in that community, I would join that church. I was reminded recently of one of my, one of my visits here. I've been visiting people in the congregation particularly those who are homebound. And I was reminded of the best greeter I think this church has ever had, the best greeter I've ever known. You know who I'm saying, don't you? Winnie MacArthur. You remember Winnie? Some of you have been around. Winnie MacArthur. This couple told me the reason we joined the church was because of Winnie MacArthur. I remember when she passed, I thought, what are we going to do without Winnie MacArthur? Winnie never met a stranger. I pray for a church full of Winnie's. Never underestimate the power of one friendly person in the life of a church. Winnie taught me that. Now, my most memorable experience of hospitality was at an Episcopal church of all places in Pasadena, California. It was a large Episcopal church. Joe was attending that congregation at the time as he was going through his agnostic phase but still seeking. And 
He was trying to sort out his faith and life. He had connected with a, a, actually the priest of the church in a locker room of a gym. You never know where the connections are made. And he decided to go hear this priest. And he started attending. He never joined, but he attended. So when we visited Joe, we thought, well, we'll go to the church that Joe's going to. From the moment we parked our car, you could tell they wanted us to be there. There was a tent outside the sanctuary, like you have at tailgate parties, those kind of tents. And the word on the tent said, welcome. As a visitor, we knew exactly where to go. There they gave us a red gift bag, I guess red for Holy Spirit, I don't know why. It was filled with information about the church, and within minutes, someone came up to us and said they knew we were a visitor because we had the red gift bag. I thought, that's a pretty sly operation, isn't it? Get them a red gift bag, we know who the visitors are. And so we carried our red gift bag and we got welcomed. At the welcome table, I saw something odd. They invited us to fill out a name tag and to get a name tag like we have here, right? I thought, well, no, name tags are only for members, right? Not for them. You don't have to be a member to get a name tag in that church. They want you to feel included from the very first day you step in the door. They want you to be, know you're a part of their family as you are on your journey of faith. In other words, you could belong before you became a member. Now, that was a welcoming gesture. The worship included liturgy translated into Spanish. Their prayer cards and information for children were both in English and Spanish. They invited visitors with the pastor following each of their three services. Interestingly, they did not have a friendship register. You know what they asked us to do? Check in on Facebook. So that's what we did. And to my amazement, we were eating lunch and I got a phone call. It was from a member of the church saying, we're glad you came. It was at lunch. This was less than an hour after we visited. Man, they were on all cylinders there. Now I say all of this not simply to tell you about my journeys being a stranger in the church or to teach you about hospitality of other Christians and other churches. I share this not because we ought to be nice to strangers. My mama taught we all be nice to strangers. I got that. I share this not because these are good practices for churches that actually want to grow. I share this because I actually have read the scriptures. When you dig into the scriptures like the ones we read today, it is very clear to me how we deal with strangers is not just a matter of being nice or kind or trying to grow a church. It goes far deeper than any of that. How you treat strangers is actually a matter of one's faithfulness to God. Welcoming the stranger was clearly important to the Lord our God. Our passages today are just a few of the passages I could have chosen for you today. The Lord says in Deuteronomy, you shall love the stranger. Why? Because you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Do you remember when you were a stranger? That's why you should love strangers. By the way, I note the word is shall. He didn't say you may love strangers. You shall love strangers. My mama taught me the difference between a shall and a may. That's an imperative in scripture. In Leviticus, we hear these instructions that are often repeated at the Jewish Seder. The stranger who resides with you shall be to you as a native. The stranger who resides with you shall be to you as a native among you, and you shall love him as yourself. For you were aliens in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. That's the underlining point. Any questions about how you're supposed to treat others? Treat them like family. Now that one should sound familiar to you because it's the second part of the great commandment of Jesus. He lifts that up out of all the commandments. That's one of the ones he lifts up. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then if you remember, he goes on to tell the story of the Good Samaritan. And who is the Good Samaritan? Somebody of another ethnic, religious class of people that were often the enemies of the Jews. If you, if you want to get the shock value, make the Palestinian your friend. That's how shocking that would have been to the ears of Jesus' audience, people of another cultural, religious, ethnic tradition. Jesus is making it abundantly clear to me that God's hospitality is for everyone, everyone, regardless of religion, race, where you came from. Paul, no doubt, knew these scriptures as his Pharisee of Pharisees. He picked up on them. He told the church at Rome, now contribute to the needs of the saints, help the, those who are struggling, and extend hospitality 
to strangers. Those are two, two things you put together. In other words, offer your money to help the poor and offer yourselves to make people feel welcome. During my sabbatical time, I listened to some, some, some scholars give some lectures at the Tantor Ecumenical Institute. One of the ones I really enjoyed was a lecturer named Marcy Link. She's a Jewish scholar that teaches Christianity. I love it when Jewish scholars teach Christianity. I get insights that I don't see as a Christian. She led us in a Bible study, and she wanted to explore how the scriptures deal with the other as a way to inform our Jewish-Christian dialogue. There was one thing she said that really struck with, stuck with me. She said, the imperative to love the strangers is repeated more often than any other imperative in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. The imperative to love the stranger is repeated more than any other imperative in the first five books of the Bible. She had said it was likely repeated because it's so hard. She thinks fear is one of the greatest barriers to loving the stranger. Still, there it is in our scriptures, because how we treat strangers is not just a nice idea. It's really a matter of being a faithful follower how we treat strangers speaks volumes about this faith we're professing. Calvin said, if you want to know the proof of someone's love for God, see how they love their neighbor. Then you'll know. The All Saints Church gets this. I, I really like that in that red bag they have a welcome brochure. And they wanted to make sure strangers knew they were welcome there. This is what they tell their, their strangers, their visitors. Looking for a deeper connection with the divine that you can't quite put into words? You are welcome. Not sure what you believe? You are welcome. Moving from another Christian tradition and considering the Episcopal Church? You are welcome. Lifelong Episcopalian, looking for a church where you can live out your baptismal promises? You are welcome. So as I enter this transitional time with you, I've heard a lot of you talk about wanting to have new members. We want to grow the church. I hear that. I've heard that in every transitional place I've been. That is not unique to you folks. I do think it would be a good thing for us to spend some of this time thinking about what it means to welcome people to First Presbyterian Church. I thank Charles Moody for working on signage. Right now, people don't really know when we worship here. They don't know at 10 o'clock. There's a one sign over by the fellowship hall. We had somebody say, Sunday night suppers. They sent a message last night. They didn't realize that's not our congregation gathering for Sunday night suppers. It just says Sunday night suppers. We might do better, but thank God we have people ready to do better. How we can be a more welcoming congregation is one of the major tasks of this interim. I have a sign-up sheet out there because we have three people on our member team. God bless them. We got, we got Bill Long and Ron Roscoe and Walker Brown. Three people on our member team. They are doing yeoman's work. But do you think three people can carry the weight of welcoming new members? It's going to take a team. It's going to take a large team. It's going to take a congregational effort to make that happen. So I put you to the challenge. I didn't ask permission, Walker, from your committee, but I'll ask for forgiveness. I put a sign-up sheet out there to be a part of an evangelism new member team to say we want to do something about welcoming new people to the life of this church. And we'll need all hands on deck if we want to make that happen. So I'm going to encourage people to be a part of a team. I hope that's okay with that present team. I think they said they could use a couple more people. So the sign-up sheets are out in the narthex. And if you want to learn more, talk to one of the three of them. One thing I do know that you have, and I don't want you to take this for granted. I think you might. This is just an extraordinarily warm and welcoming congregation. Do not take that for granted. You really are warm and welcoming. I saw Jose shake his head. He knows that. He's new. I love that about this church because guess what? I've been to churches that are mean and cold. You can't take a mean church and turn it into a warm and welcoming church. You can put signage up a lot easier than that, folks. So you've got what people are looking for. As I think about welcoming the stranger, I, I see it's important for everybody to be a part of the team and sitting, talking to the person to, next to you in the pews. By the way, since uh, the Michaels are here, I've got to tell them their daughter, Elizabeth, for a moment, because she's a child of this church. Sharon and I visited her when she was at Trinity Presbyterian Church in Durham. This is part of the sabbatical. 
You know, whenever Elizabeth's preaching and I have a Sunday off, I'm going to try to hear Elizabeth preach because she's just a great preacher. So we had lunch after her preaching at Trinity Avenue. And she says to us, did anyone greet you? Well, we said, well, no. She said, oh, I was afraid of that. She said, you were sitting in the dead zone of hospitality. <laughs> if you'd sat on the other side, you have received a warm welcome. I went back to the Kirk and I said, do we have a dead zone of hospitality? And they said, oh yeah. I said, where is it? They pointed to it. May we not have a dead zone of hospitality anywhere in this sanctuary. She said, if you sat there, you would have been welcome. To make sure that we don't, I just invite you and challenge you to do some simple things. Maybe you could invite, you could invite somebody to church. Maybe you could talk to one stranger a week, just one. Maybe you'll find from time to time their name is in the friendship register. They're offering a cue that they're a visitor. I was amazed in my visits. Nobody ever bothered to look at that and see that I was a visitor. It's right there in front of their eyes. Maybe you'll speak to a fellow member you don't know yet. They may be a stranger and they've been a member for 20 years. Speak to those people too. That's okay. Because I think your simple word of welcome may have a bigger impact than you may know. I know I'm almost done, I promise. I read that Americans are experiencing an epidemic of loneliness. An epidemic of loneliness. They are more connected virtually than any other <coughs> generation. What are they lacking? Well, imagine how a word of welcome might just be the word a lonely person needs to hear if they risk even coming into this church. It's a risk to come here. If you're new to the community and feeling alone, that gift of loneliness, that gift of welcome just might be what they need. If you're hurting and you're coming in here with all the burdens of hurting for whatever reason, it may be your word of welcome that opens the door that leads to their healing. If you come from someone who's been ostracized in our culture for any reason, who our culture says you're not acceptable, you walk in here, you receive the word of welcome, for some that could be life-changing. I've seen it happen. You know, I think there are people in this world looking for churches like that. I think there are people in Catawba County looking for churches like that. I know there are going to be some people moving to those new homes and apartments and all that. They're going to be looking for churches like that. May we be the kind of people that provide that kind of home, that kind of welcome. It's almost sacramental. You know what a sacrament is? An outward sign of an inward faith. Your welcome is sacramental in a way. It says that you're not just loved by us, but you're loved by the Lord our God, who, by the way, has never met a stranger. Amen. Let us pray. God, we know that you welcomed us in Christ, and we were told by Paul to welcome one another as we have been welcomed by Christ. So wherever there is a barrier or a fear that we have that keeps us from offering that word of grace and welcome, please remove it from us. May we be a means of your grace, of your love, of your acceptance in the lives of others. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.
please join me in the affirmation of faith. In life and in death, we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one true God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. We trust in God, the Holy Spirit, everywhere the giver and renewer of life. The Spirit justifies us by grace through faith, sets us free to accept ourselves and to love God and neighbor, and binds us together with all believers in the one body of Christ, the Church. In a broken and fearful world, the Spirit gives us courage to pray without ceasing, to witness among all peoples to Christ as Lord and Savior, to unmask idolatries in church and culture, to hear the voices of people long silenced, and to work with others for justice, freedom, and peace. In gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily task and to live holy and joyful lives, even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth, praying, Lord God. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Remember, Paul said, not only extend hospitality to strangers, but contribute to the needs of the saints. So today, in an offering, we often have our opportunity to contribute to the needs of the saints, whether it be here in this church or throughout this community. So in gratitude to God, let us bring our tithes and offerings before God. Let us pray. God, we offer you these gifts because we love you and we recognize that you are the giver of all good gifts, who indeed your giving knows no ending. So, Lord, receive these gifts and use them for the good work of your kingdom. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. 
as there was a preparing for communion this week, and a hymn that I've learned recently um, came to mind that I'm growing to love, and I hope you will love it if you don't already know it. If you want to refer to it, it's in um, 507. Brandon is going to line it out for us, and it, it's called Come to the Table of Grace. And line it out for us, and this will be our invitation today. do one verse, but I do note the other ones. Come to the table of peace, of love, of hope and joy. This is the table of grace and peace and hope and love and joy. It's not the table of the church, it's the table of Jesus Christ who invites us to come to this very special place. So come to you who have much faith and those of you who have little. You who have been here often and maybe you have not been here for a long time. You have tried to follow and those of us who have failed. Come because Christ invites us here and desires that we be fed at this table of grace. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Great and wonderful are your works, God, creator of all. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who lived a human life and knew our joys and sorrows. In him your kingdom came down to earth. He came down that we may have love. He came down to heal those who are broken in body or spirit. He came down to forgive sinners and offer a new way of life. And he came down to call disciples to follow him and proclaim his kingdom in our lives and in our churches. In obedience to you, he took up his cross and died in love for us and for all the world. You raised him from the dead to live and reign forever. He is the friend of sinners still. Gracious God, send your Holy Spirit to bless us, and these your gifts of the bread and the cup, that in communion with Christ our Lord we may receive his life and remain his glad and faithful people until we feast with him in glory. As we share in the body and blood of Christ, may we we become a living sacrifice, dedicated and fit for your acceptance. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us how to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus, on the night before he died, took bread, and after he gave thanks to God, he broke it. And he said, Take, eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. It was shed for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. For every time you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord till he comes again. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. And I remind you that those of you who need gluten-free wafers, they are available as we take in tension. They are available in the center as a wafer. Those are gluten-free for you. I invite the elders to come forward who are serving communion.
Let's join together in our prayer after communion. Now, Lord, let your servant devote in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of every people, light to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Amen.
Go out in peace to love and serve the Lord, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the presence of the Holy Spirit be with you today and forever. Amen. Thank you.